Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's caregiver chat. My name is Lakeland Hogan Eichenberger. I'm Home Instead's gerontologist and caregiver advocate. We'll be getting started in just a moment, but want to give everyone a few minutes to get logged into Zoom or to join us on Facebook. Um, today, we'll, we're going to talk all about working family caregivers. Um, but before we dive into the topic, just a few quick housekeeping items. Um, these caregiver chats are sponsored by Home Instead. If you'd like to learn more about Home Instead's in-home care services, you can visit homeinstead.com. You can also follow us on Facebook. We have several active Facebook communities, uh, our general Home Instead page, but we also have a Remember for Alzheimer's Families group uh, that is a great community of family caregivers. Um, and so we'll drop the links to that. You can follow us. And we also post about these chats in our whole chat series there. Uh, so you can follow us uh, and get the latest on what chat is has just happened or what one is coming up. Uh, and we do record these and put them back out on our Facebook page and on our website. And we also love questions. So at any point, if you have a question, please put them into the chat function on Zoom. You can use the Q&A box or the chat function. And then on Facebook, if you're joining us there, you can just comment below uh, and we'll get to as many of those questions as we can in today's caregiver chats. So again, my name is Lakeland Hogan Eichenberger. I'm Home Instead's gerontologist and caregiver advocate, and I'm joined by Liz. I'll formally introduce her in just a moment, but hi, Liz. Welcome. Hi. Thanks for having me. Oh, we're so excited to have you. Um, and I mentioned today's topic is working family caregivers. And over the past decade, we've really seen an increase of supports for working parents of small children, but now there's another caregiving group that employers are starting to pay attention to, and that's caregivers of aging parents, family members, or loved ones. And there are 53 million caregivers in the U.S., and 61%, about that amount, uh, are working in addition to their caregiving Role and they're trying to kind of balance the demands of their career and of caregiving. Many have had to make really tough decisions because of the caregiving that they're doing uh, is uh, that caregiving is impacting their careers. They might need to cut back on their hours. They might need to use all of their PTO to take their loved one uh, to appointments or for various caregiving duties. They might cut back to part time or pass up promotions, uh, just to name kind of a few of those impacts. And it can be challenging to balance it all. So we're grateful that you are here. And I'm excited to be joined by Liz O'Donnell to talk more about this. She really is an expert. She is the founder of Working Daughter. It's a community for women balancing elder care and, and their career. She's also an award-winning writer. Her book, Working Daughters, A Guide to Caring for Your Aging Parents While Earning a Living, was named one of the best books of the year by Library Journal. She's also been recognized as a caregiving expert. Uh, and in 2020, she created National Working Daughters Today, Working Daughters Day. And we were just talking about the fact that that will be this year on November 15th. So mark your calendar. Uh, she's written on this topic uh, for many outlets, including the Atlantic, Harvard Business Review. She's been profiled in health and Aussie media. She's delivered keynotes on this topic at conferences and to companies. She's also written another book, Mogul, Mom, and Maid, The Balancing Act of the Modern Woman, which looks at the impact of women's personal lives on their careers. That was an Amazon bestseller. So, I mean, I could go on and on. Uh, she is an incredible resource, and so we're very grateful to have her with us. Liz, thank you so much for being here. Lakeland, thank you. I'm so thrilled that you're having this conversation. It's so important. Oh, it absolutely is. Uh, and so Liz, before we really jump in, I would love for everyone on uh, today's caregiver chats to just learn a little bit about you. Uh, so would you mind sharing your caregiving journey and why you started Working Daughters? Sure. I uh, My caregiving experience started with what I label the caregiving creep. So it's when you're going along in your life and I was going along, busy working mother, two young kids, 
travel for work all the time. I just written my first book, ironically, about you know the challenges of working mothers when daughterhood just started to creep up on me. My parents were in their 80s. And they just started needing more and more. So, you know, at first it was like going down every once a month and mowing their lawn or helping change a light bulb. And then, um, you know, my mom asked for help sorting the mail and my husband took over paying the bills. And then every Sunday night between them, they had so many pills, you know, and started to get confused by them every Sunday or over the weekend, you know, it's sort everything into those week long pill boxes. And um, then my mom stopped driving. My dad had already given up his license. So then it was groceries and trips to the doctors and I you, that phase this creeping phase where it's just caregiving is just kind of coming upon us I think for so many of us we already have these really packed lives and for me I didn't realize what was happening I just knew I was getting more stressed more cranky quite frankly you know more exhausted um, and so that was how it started and that phase of caregiving, I think, is also really difficult for me. It was from a career perspective, because that's the phase where you start to get a lot of personal calls and you start to take a lot of time off to go take your parents to the doctors. And, and there's no name for it. No one's talking about it. You know, I don't have a growing belly. So people don't see like, oh, there's a new phase in her life, you know, like she's the motherhood. It's just like, what's up with Liz? She's not, you know, quite the, the co-worker she used or the employee she used to be. So that's how it started. Then, you know, the second very common entry point happened to me, the crisis call. And for me, it was both of my parents getting sick. In fact, they were both diagnosed with terminal illnesses on the same exact day. So my dad was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And then I left that doctor's appointment. My mom had uh, the day before been taken to the ER with stomach pain and she was diagnosed. I got a call from another hospital uh, before I even left the first hospital and they said she had ovarian cancer. Um, so then it was total crisis mode. And so I think you asked why working daughter? Well, because all of a sudden I was so unprepared. I was thrust into this you know, experience. Um, I felt completely alone. I didn't know there were 50 three other, you know, million other people out there. It felt like just me because no one had ever talked about this before. And I vowed that when I got through this, I would um, do something about it because it just seemed to me like all of these resources were focused on working parents and, you know, me included, I had just written a book about it, but I had never heard anybody talking about workers with parents. And for me, staying employed during that whole experience was the hardest, hardest thing I had to do. Wow. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story. And I can only imagine how stressful that day was for you when you, you got both of those diagnoses or your parents received those and, and you're left to wonder, okay, now what? Uh, and I think I, I, I've recently just heard that term for the first time, caregiver, caregiving creep. And I'm like, wow, that is a, a really great way to describe it because mm -hmm. so many people just you know, feel like, okay, I'm just being a good daughter. I'm just helping mom and dad here or there. And over time, like that, that role tends to grow. Uh, and before you know it, you are a caregiver, even though you might not self-identify as a caregiver, um, but you really are taking on those roles. Um, as, as I like how you said, uh, how did you phrase it? it was you're working with adult parents or something of that nature. Yeah, we talk about working parents and I, I'm trying to you know, add the focus. I wouldn't say shift the focus, but add the focus to workers with parents. Workers. And, and as you said in your intro, we're just now starting to recognize that this is a group we need to care about. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and I guess one follow-up question, you know, why daughters? I know when you kind of look at the statistics, uh, it makes sense to me, but would you mind sharing why, yeah. why you kind of yeah. decided to focus there? Well, there were a few reasons. And, you know, I mean, the first is simply work with what you know. So I knew my experience as a working mother, um, as a woman in the workplace. Um, so part of it was, you know, and I knew I was going to, the, the first way I was going to tackle this problem was with a book. So write what you know. Then um, the other reason is I felt like sort of like you know, what you were just saying about caregiver creep. If we don't label things, if we don't give things names, then I feel like we don't address them and we don't solve for them. So I felt like it was really important to create a, a, a category or a title uh, that people could say, oh, I get it. Working mother, working daughter. Oh, I see. You know, I can see you now. And then we could have conversations about it. So that was part of it. But um, 
you know, I'm well aware of the statistics that 40% of all family caregivers are men. And I, men are always welcome in the working daughter community. We call them our working dudes, um, and just to keep with the WD logo and theme. Um, and I, you know, hope that all of the work we do is uh, relevant to, you know, caregivers of any gender. But for me, it was important to address some of the specific challenges that women face in their careers. You know, oftentimes that women have already stepped out of the workforce for a while, taken a break to parent. They might get the, you know, the mommy penalty that we hear about. Um, and then they could potentially be stepping out of their career or changing up their career at a time where, um, you know, the average family caregiver is in their late 40s or 50s, although we, we have members and see caregivers of all ages now, you know, people are coming into the group in their early 20s, it's just amazing. But um, for the average family caregiver, a woman who's struggling with her career in her late 40s or early 50s, if she decides that she can't balance work and care and she steps out and then she wants to get back in, she's got some real challenges, unfortunately, uh, facing getting rehired and re-entering the workforce. Then there's, you know, there's the pay, gender-based pay gap. Women oftentimes earn less than men do um, in their careers. And um, women live longer than men on average. And so, um, and you see so many women living in their senior years in poverty. So it's scary to me that if we don't solve for this and make care and career you know, more compatible, then how are women going to support themselves and pay for their own long-term care? So um, again, never meant to exclude men, but just wanted to address some of the specific issues surrounding women. Well, thanks for providing more insight on that. Yeah. And gosh, you brought up so many great um, points there. I mean, we could spend a live chat talking about each of those points individually. Uh, there's so much to cover when it comes to this topic. And, and you've mentioned a few of the challenges already, but maybe we could dive a little deeper, kind of um, revisit some of the challenges that working family caregivers face. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you say are kind of some of the top ones? I would say um, the isolation, and I don't just mean social isolation, but the fact that, um, you know, despite the fact that there are 53 million of us, it seems like we're all reinventing the wheel, um, that every family caregiver is figuring this out for themselves. And I think that stems from the fact that we haven't had enough conversations like this. Um, in 2015, I wrote an article for The Atlantic um, about, I think it was called The Crisis Facing American, America's Working Daughters and sort of introduced the concept of working daughterhood. Um, but at that time, that was like the only article in the mainstream media that I could find that sort of addressed this situation. Now, what's that, seven years later, we're having so many more conversations. There's so many more books. There's so many more articles. Um, so, so there's been a change. But but people get to this stage, they haven't thought about it, they haven't prepared for it, um, they maybe haven't seen it. You know, for me, um, I had four grandparents, my parents weren't caregivers, not because they weren't, you know, good sons and daughters, they were very devoted to their parents, but all four of my grandparents died from cardiac related issues pretty quickly. So people are living longer with chronic illnesses. So this is kind of a new phenomenon, to, you know, to some degree, wide generalization. So, um, I think the challenge is that we're all figuring this out on our own. Yeah, that's, I think the point that you made about, you know, we're living longer. And so people are, you know, kind of experiencing caregiving, um, you know, differently now than perhaps um, a while back. And it really does depend kind of family to family, as, as you mentioned. Yeah. Um, so that um, the fact that we're all kind of figuring it out, um, it can be, as you said, isolating, it's challenging. So that's why I think it's so great that you have created your community at, at Working Daughters. And um, I think there's so many more caregiving communities that have come about in the last you know, five or so years. Um, and so caregivers can feel less alone. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when it comes to the workplace, I know you and I um, kind of talked as we prepared for this chat yeah. about how caring for an older parent is a little more unpredictable at times than maybe caring for young children. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and I think that's a huge factor in what makes um, balancing you know, elder care and career so, so difficult. It is the unpredictability. When and, and again, I don't mean to compare constantly to parenting, but um, 
you know, it's sort of our base point, right, for having these conversations and talking about uh, people in the workplace. But when, so when you think about parenting, you know, assuming somebody has a healthy child, there's a pretty predictable timeline of how healthy children develop. And likewise, there's a predictable calendar, you know, so you know that you have a baby, well, you're pregnant, you know about what time you're going to need to take leave, right? And you can predict, although women often, you know, change how long they take leave, but you know about how long um, you're going to be at home, you know, with the baby after, and when you might return to work. And then you know how many years it's going to be before that child goes into school and how many hours uh, preschool is and how many hours, you know, first grade is and when that, you know, when, when those number of hours increase. So you can kind of plan um, what your life is going to be, what your work life is going to be, how you're going to show up at work. Then not, and then you know that, um, you know, depending on where your kid goes to school, that there's going to be a week long break in February, March and or April. And that, you know, the summers are going to be, uh, if they're going to be home and need, need a plan. You don't know any of that with elder care. Elder care can happen anytime. You know, you could, you don't, you might not realize the creep is happening. The creep could go on for a very long time um, and it could be semi-sustainable, but then there could be the crisis call. You never know when that's going to happen. And even if, you know, you do get the crisis call, the, one of the questions I get all the time when somebody's parent is hospitalized is, do I take time off now when they're in the hospital or do I take time off later when they're at home? Like, when am I going to need to be home? Excellent question. It's so unpredictable. And that makes it really hard, I think, both for, you know, employers, managers to figure out how to support working caregivers, but for working caregivers to figure out um, how do I, how do I navigate this? Mm. And how do you think people in general are doing when it comes to navigating this? I know you, you interact with a lot of, of these working uh, caregivers. So how, um, how are people coping with these really demands on their time these yeah significant have, demands on their time huge demands i have two messages on that um and i think <laughs> they're equally important and one is i think the world needs to know they're not coping well the working daughters and sons are really 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 struggling there is just not enough support for them both you know social structure um, and workplace structure. And I see and talk to, I, you know, I talk to working daughters every single day and some of them are really just, you know, they are caring for somebody at their own expense, their mental health, their physical health. Spoke to a woman the other day who um, left her job four years ago and has no income. She's out of savings. She has, you know, she's trying to get back into work. She's in her fifties. She's hoping she can get a job. She doesn't know how she's going to off uh, set all of the hands-on care that she's provided that, you know, the valuable unpaid work that she's providing, but she knows she has to build up her bank account again. Um, I mean, these are really serious scenarios. So I think it's important people know that caregivers are really, really, really struggling. And at the same time, and we have a philosophy in the working daughter community that you can hold two opposing truths at the same time. So, and at the same time, I, I just think um, so many working daughters and sons are handling this phenomenally. They are, I mean, I've got the poster of the working daughter behind me who looks like a superhero for a reason. I mean, I say we're all wearing capes. We just tuck them in because if people saw them, they'd be intimidated, right? Of, I mean, these are people who are doing nursing skills with no nursing experience, financial planning, you know, social work, um, negotiation, they're doing advocacy work for the people they care for. I, it, it, I find it hard to uh, understand why a working caregiver isn't on the top of every hiring manager shortlist for somebody to hire. I mean, these people have skills. Yeah, absolutely. And if, and if they can work with an employer to Kind of find some of that balance, you know, to uh, be able to still maintain a caregiving role while working. It can mm -hmm. really, they can really be an asset because, as you mentioned, they're probably the best multitaskers. They uh, have, you know, problem solved over and over, and uh, often are great communicators. So the skills of a caregiver um, 
are are very unique and, and valuable as as you mentioned. Right. And they have purpose and focus. So they're going to get in, they're going to get it done. I mean, purely from a marketplace perspective, we could, you know, in, in a, a rapidly aging society, the boomers, you know, such a huge population. I mean, there's huge market potential. I mean, these are people who know the market, right? Um, when I was caring for my husband, he had cancer and, you know, the cancer caused so many different things to go wrong. I was um, organizing or, or coordinating with like seven different departments in the hospital. And I always say, I dare you to find the hospital administrator that could do it as well as I could, you know, I mean, the skills are really impressive. Mm, yes, absolutely. Um, and so you're, you're talking to these caregivers, you, you have this working daughter community. What kind of tips do you offer working caregivers on, you know, how to balance it all, to find balance between work and life and caregiving. Um, what would be some of those kind of top tips that you offer? Yeah, I would start with, I mean, it really becomes sort of a, a, a value um, business, if you will. I think it's really important that working caregivers or all caregivers really get clear about their own personal value set. And that might sound a little, you know, wishy-washy when we're looking for workplace tips, but because there are so many demands on a working caregiver, um, we all have to decide what's most important to us because the way I do it isn't going to be the right way for you to do it. And there's really no one right way to caregive anyway, right? Yeah. Um, and you're dealing with aging, you're often dying, you know, dementia, disease, none of these things have predictable linear timelines. So you really have to be fluid. So when a situation is so fluid, how do you make decisions? And for me, it's getting really clear on what's most important to you. Um, you know, so for, for me, for example, I got really clear on um, what my post caregiving life, what I wanted that to look like. So um, it can be challenging, I think, for people to think about post caregiving, because you're saying, think about when your parents no longer here. And some people think that's a horrible thought to have. But I found it to be a really powerful tool to think about, okay, this is not forever. And it feels like my life is going to hell in a handbasket at this moment, but I can't let that happen. So what will be important to have in place when this is over? And for me, that was I had to stay employed, even though, you know, there were day, many, many, many days I thought that was an impossible task, but I needed to continue to earn and provide for my family. So that allowed me to make decisions sometimes through that lens, like what's the minimum I need to do in the situation so that I still have a job to return to when, when this is all over. I wanted to stay, you know, married and, um, <laughs> and, you know, not have everything go to hell with my husband and caregiving can cause, you know, quite, quite a lot of strain on a relationship. So, you know, how did I want to conduct myself in my most important relationships so that um, those would be intact? I wanted to not need caregiving when this was over. So what did I have to do at a minimum to take care of myself? You know, how much walking did I need to do every day? What food choices did I need to make? So I think you start with that post caregiving vision, and then you do what you can to move towards that. Nothing's gonna be perfect, but you start with that. Then from a more, you know, sort of practical tip standpoint, from a work perspective, I would say, um, act like you're pregnant every single day. And what I mean by that is, you know, when I went out on my maternity leaves, when you know that you're pregnant and maternity leave is imminent, I started to keep a running list of projects. I started to heavily CC all of my coworkers on all communication with customers and clients and any major projects. You know, I didn't, I didn't go it alone at all. Um, so that if you ever get that, you know, for me, it was so that if the baby came, you know, early, I knew I could run out the door and not have to give it any more thought. And I knew that my coworkers would feel like I had set things up well for them. So I think it's the same thing. If you have aging parents, if you have sick family members that you're caring for, expect the crisis call could come at any time. Don't save anything to your hard drive, you know, save it to the G drive, the Google drive or the server. Make sure that whatever you're working on is accessible to other people so you can run out the door. Um, and I feel like care, caregiving, you know, is so cyclical that at some point you're gonna have to cover for me and at some point I'm going to have to cover for you. So the better I set things up, the more likely your coworkers are going to be uh, willing to sort of pitch in and, and fill in for you. Um, the other thing is never to surprise your boss if you can't, you know, I mean, if, if you can avoid not surprising a boss, it's just always a good rule of thumb. That leads to whether or not right to tell your boss what's going on. Um, and that can be tricky, uh, tricky situation. So I would say, you know, we all have to sort of read our own uh, workplace environments and get a sense of 
how much we should reveal in the workplace. But um, I always advise people to check your company handbook and your HR policies and see what is of it, you know, is there leave available? Do we have a, a family, you know, care policy or a leave policy? Know what your sort of boundaries are and then decide if it makes sense to reveal, you know, hey, my mom's in the hospital right now. And if something happens, I might need to run. Here's what I have work, you know, here's what I'm working on. Here's what you can count on. And, and here's what you can't count on. I made the mistake sometimes during some of my crises when my dad's dementia got really bad and I was called to the ER, you know, a number of times and I was canceling trips to kind to sort of like soft pedal it. And I'm like, well, I'm really stressed out and I don't know if I can do that tomorrow. I knew damn well I wasn't going to be up for whatever meeting the next day. And then getting really upset that, you know, the next day people are like, where are you, Liz? You ready to go? You know, I wasn't clear that I needed help. Um, and that just caused problems for me, for my team, for everybody. There are so many good tips that I'm just kind of absorbing in this moment. I've never quite heard anyone talk about, um, you know, evaluating what's going to be important to you in your post caregiving life. I think that that is really um, insightful. I don't think I hear many people talk about that. I feel like I've done a lot of these chats. We've not really talked a lot about thinking about that because in that, I love how you said that that can help you prioritize in the moment because sometimes it can feel like everything is so important. And while it might be as a caregiver, you might have to choose in that moment. And if you kind of know your, your values and what's most important, hopefully it can help you kind of navigate those tricky situations. And then I just love those, those practical tips that you just offered of, of being prepared and, you know, kind of being direct. And, um, because I know so many, so often, and, um, maybe it's a trait of, of females, we, we want to be there for everyone. And so we want to be that reliable coworker, we want to be that reliable daughter, but sometimes you just, you have to be, to be honest about where your limits lie uh, so that you don't end up disappointing people. Um, and so I think some of those tips were, were really, really uh, helpful and insightful. And I love how you talked about, you know, checking the HR plan. I think also check in with benefits too, wouldn't you yes. say, Liz? Um, yeah. What are some of the benefits that you have seen um, throughout kind of the, the folks that you've worked with that can support caregivers? Well, more and more companies are starting to bring in like these third party organizations that can provide um, access to care coordinators. And that's huge. Um, some insurance, you know, health insurance plans have access to, uh, you know, mental health support, which I think is huge for caregivers or um, even, you know, paid leave or, um, you know, services that help with stress management. So, I don't know about it, you, but for me, when, you know, we have those mandatory benefit meetings at work, I'm always like, you know, turn the camera off and, you know, <laughs> maybe play a little wordle or something while this, you know, it just feels like blah, blah, blah. But if you do take the time to sort of look into your healthcare benefits, there can be some nice hidden gems in there that can just help you manage the stress. So I think it's important to look at that and look at the handbook. And then, you know, some of the companies I see that are doing great work in the space are companies like Wealthy is one, Home Thrive is another. And so again, these are third party companies that, you know, your, your company can partner with so that if you do walk into HR, your manager's office, and you say, you know, I'm in the creep, say, for example, like my mom needs more, I don't know how to access it. I don't have time to access it. They say, I'm going to hook you up with a, you know, with our partner, and they're going to manage all of this for you. Huge, huge, easy benefits that I think companies can provide. That's great. I, I do love seeing companies um, starting to focus on resources for yeah. these working caregivers, because um, I think, as we talked about earlier, you know, working caregivers are, are valuable employees. And especially in today's employment environment, where everyone is hiring, pretty much, um, you know, we want to, employers want to retain as many of, of, of their employees, especially the good ones. And so if they can offer benefits um, to help them kind of maintain that balance, um, I think that that is to the benefit of both the caregiver and the employer. And um, I, I would think too, you know, with COVID, while it, it provided some additional kind of stress and strain for caregivers in general, I think it also helped employers see that, you know, people can work remotely or kind of create different schedules to adapt to their home life and still be 
successful employees. Um, and so I really hope that we see that continue on into kind of this post COVID world uh, that we're kind of starting to venture into. So that flexibility um, is becoming kind of a benefit or um, something that kind of uh, employers are using to recruit uh, employees. Yeah. Yeah. And I think flexibility, I mean, that to me is the number one thing that you can provide to make life easier or, you know, make care and career more compatible. And for the reasons that we talked about a few minutes, the unpredictability factor, um, you know, and it can be the difference between, you know, letting people maybe change their hours slightly when they start and when they leave, it can be the difference between like taking the entire day off or leaving for a couple of hours, you know, to drop someone at adult daycare or take someone to the doctor or wait for, uh, you know, an in-home caregiver who might be running late. Uh, you know, do you want people to have to call in for the entire day or can you give them some flexibility to live their lives? Because every single employee has a life. <laughs> yeah. And I, like you said, I think, you know, that was one of the takeaways from COVID is we literally saw into each other's homes, right? And whether it was me getting the pandemic puppy and, you know, and those were my interruptions or somebody's, you know, parent you know, Zoom bombing with dementia or, uh, you know, somebody having to excuse themselves from the meeting to go set their kid up on, you know, online classroom. It, it leveled the playing field in some sense in that people realize we all have complicated lives and like you said, you know, the productivity numbers went up and we can all get it done. Imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So we've talked about a few um, of the great resources um, and and just wondering if there are any other you know, tips or suggestions that you would offer up to caregivers before we dive into questions, because we have some great questions coming in. So any other okay. you know, tips or resources that you would point caregivers to? I would think about, um, you know, who's the team you can build around you. I always say caregiving, you know, should be a team sport, but it often feels like, you know, you're a solo player out there. Um, and, and I get it. Caregiving can be, especially elder care can be such an intimate um, assignment that, yeah, there are certain things that maybe you just can't outsource or pass off to other people because you're dealing with an adult and you know their needs. So maybe you know you're the only one who can take mom to the doctor or the only one who can support mom with dressing and you know bathing and that sort of thing. Um, but what can you outsource? Because we really can't do it all. We can try to do it all, but we can't do it all. And you know for me those were the sort of the non-intimate, I guess, tasks, right? I mean we and, and, and I think this is a great tip for if there's a caregiver in your life and you're like, I really want to help them, but I just don't know how. Think about, you know, what you do every day from when you wake up to when you go to sleep. You know, do you drink coffee? Well, oh, groceries. You can, you can help somebody get groceries, right? Do they have shampoo and soap? You know, you can help them with errands. Um, you can help them with household tasks and chores. So who are the people on your team that, you know, you potentially can call? Maybe, you know, for me, I had neighbors who would always call and say or text and, and it was great. They wouldn't text me and say, um, I, do you need groceries this week? They would text and say, I'm at the grocery store right now. What can I put in my cart for you? And it made it so much easier for someone um, like me who doesn't like to ask for help to say, oh my God, yes, I need butter or I don't know, whatever, you know, as opposed to like, oh, I'm not going to call Lakeland and ask her to do my grocery shopping. That's a huge imposition. So you do have people that you can find, you know, create a team around you. From a work perspective, I had a coworker who saw my frustration trying to manage my team um, and, you know, working in different time zones. I did all of the things you said up front that caregivers do. I took a job with less responsibility because I couldn't do the job I was originally hired to do when I was caring for my parents. I um, used up all of my paid time off to create a flexible schedule. And I was really lucky in that one, I had paid time off to that. Um, I was allowed to change my schedule on a week by week basis. Um, but event, my team was never knew where I was and they were really frustrated. And this one coworker said, went to our boss and he said, let me be Liz's liaison. And so every day Liz can tell me what she needs from everybody else. And at the end of the day, I'm going to run around the office and make sure everyone knows, you know, to send what they owe to Liz. Cause I might be logging back on at 11 o'clock that night or at six o'clock the next morning. And I mean, I never would have thought of this and I'm so um, appreciative of what he did, but what a great person to put on your team, the coworker who has your back. 
so many great tips there. And I also see a lot of great tips that participants are putting into the chat. So thank you everyone for, for sharing your thoughts and tips. And, and Liz, I think, again, just another great set of tips for those that are with us today on this caregiver chat. Um, and so now we're going to open up for questions. Um, we have a good handful of questions that are coming in. So we'll, we'll kind of get started with those. But if again, if you have joined us late, uh, we are taking questions live. You can put them in the Q&A box or the chat function in Zoom. Or if you're on Facebook, you can just comment below and we'll get to as many um, questions as we possibly can. Uh, we did have one question. Uh, They're asking, what about working wives? And we've been talking a lot about working daughters. And I know that, you know, we, we were talking about working caregivers in general, but any, um, do you see a lot of working wives that come to your group? Uh, any tips for, for kind of that subset of this caregiving population? Yeah. And you know, I mean, I'm in marketing and I, and I have been a working wife and I never could figure out the term. So thank you. I don't know why it was just, wasn't obvious to me what to call the working spouse. Um, I think the tips are the same um, for, a, you know, apply as well. And like I said, I cared for after my dad passed away, my husband was diagnosed with cancer. So I became a spousal caregiver myself. Um, and so, and, and what was a relief for me was I was writing the working daughter book while I was caring for my husband. And I was able to say, oh good, my, my um, tips actually really work. I was able to apply them for myself. So I think the tips are the same. I mean, I, I think what's challenging depending on how old that working wife is, um, it, again, it can be such an isolating experience. You know, I was a working wife at 50 years old. Um, so you can feel very othered in the workplace because, you know, hopefully this isn't happening to your other peers, um, you know, what's happening to you. So I think finding support groups and yeah, we absolutely have a lot of working wives who range in age in the, in the working daughter community, but finding a group of people who see you and understand you, I think is really important. But as far as the practical tips of balancing um, care and career, I think those are the same. Thank you for sharing that. And we have been posting links to the Working Daughters website in the okay. chat. So be sure to, to check out Liz's community and, and get plugged in because I think that connecting with other caregivers is so important. I was just on a support group call yesterday and we had somebody join us for the first time and she said, I finally feel less alone. And I think that, or I could just kind of hear the relief in her voice. And so, um, you know, connecting with others. Again, you get great tips like we're, we're sharing here in this group chat today, uh, but you also, you feel less alone. And that is so, so important. Where you might feel alone in the workplace, there are communities that exist that um, people are going through very similar things and you can connect in, in yeah. different ways, such as in online groups or online chats like this. Um, Deborah is asking, what do I do when I can't physically care for my husband? It sounds like he has um, uh, a, a disease that impacts her husband's mobility. Um, and so she says there's a number of other issues that take a lot of her time and energy. So what can she do when she physically can't care for her husband? Any thoughts for Deborah on that? Yeah, and I don't say this lightly because I know how expensive care is, um, but I would look into how to bring in or, uh, you know, get um, professional or paid caregivers to support you uh, for a number of reasons. And, and yeah, and like I said, I don't mention that lightly because, you know, private paid care is very, very expensive. Um, and, you know, so, and I don't know her circumstances, so there could be options, right, for Medicaid and, and other services as well. But I think one of the barriers that we often face, whether as working daughters or working wives, is um, that we feel like this is something we should be doing and that we should be able to do, right? To care for someone you love, you know, or, or who loved you or cared for you. I, I like to be careful that not all of us are caring for someone we love. So I, I avoid the term loved one personally. So I just want to correct myself there. Some of us are caring for parents who maybe didn't care for us well, right? But as the person who steps up to be a caregiver, whether or not it feels like a choice, you are stepping up to be a caregiver. And that says a lot about the kind of person you are and the kind of person you are uh, most likely, and I'm generalizing, but I talk to a lot of you every day is someone who is used to doing a really good job and giving things your all. And so part of that, I think, and we've been raised to be 
good girls and good students and good wives and then good daughters. So it's ingrained in us, I think, again, why generalization, but to be the one and, and you don't outsource that. Like this is what your family member would want, right? They would want you and this is what a good daughter does and this is what a good wife does. And at some point that can get in the way of being a wife or being a daughter. And I hear this all the time, um, is I miss just being their daughter. And I, I, you know, I experienced it myself. My dad was living up the street at an assisted living facility. I was able to carve out at least one weeknight and one full weekend day to be with him. But sometimes those weeknights or weekend days were done, you know, cleaning his apartment or running errands or taking him to the doctor. And so there was no time just to be dad and Liz. Um, and I remember my dad's, my husband's oncologist saying to me at one point, he's like, it's time for you to rethink how you're doing things because you need to be his wife. And so we think it's a, a, a failure if we bring in outside help, if we place someone in a facility um, or a community, I should say, but it's actually sometimes the best decision all around. You know, with my dad, again, it got to the point he wasn't able to stay in assisted living anymore. Um, and I felt heartbroken that I was going to be moving him into a nursing home, felt just like the wrong thing to do. And, but I didn't see any other options. So I moved him into a nursing home. And you know what, all of a sudden I realized he was getting the quality of care that he deserved that I was never able to do as a non-professional. And it freed me up to be his daughter and to change the way we spent time together. And he was cleaner and he was better nourished. So I would say, don't be afraid to look at changing how things are, renegotiate either with the person you care for or with you know the promises you made to yourself about how care is given and what role you can play. Sometimes it's the more compassionate thing, even though it might not feel like it. That's such, such great advice. And I think too, um, sometimes promises, you know, you said promises made to yourself, but sometimes we also make promises to our loved ones, such as I'll never put you in a community. And I tell caregivers to try to avoid that right. because you don't know what the future holds. You don't have that crystal ball. So, you know, your loved one might get to that point where they do need extra help in the home or need to move mm -hmm. uh, to another living situation. And so, um, because often I, I see promises like that associated with a lot of guilt so when guilt. those those uh, changes need to happen. And I think caregivers experience enough guilt anyway, so we can reduce guilt in any small way. Mm -hmm. um, that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, and, and as a good follow-up question to this conversation, Kimberly was asking, how do you find information about respite health? So you had mentioned, Liz, you know, sometimes it's good to hire help into the home. Um, respite is um, often kind of that break or time away from the caregiving role. So any thoughts for Kimberly on, you know, how she could go about finding respite or how people could go about finding help in the home? Can I actually flip that back to you? Because I think oh, sure. when I had a conversation yeah, a while ago, you had such great advice and you taught me some things about respite when we talked like a month ago. Do you yeah. to I have you answer that? Because you'll do yeah. a better job. Absolutely. Yeah, we did have a whole, whole hour long conversation yeah. almost just on respite care. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so respite, as I mentioned, is a break from the caregiving role. Um, and so, you know, you could hire, you know, an in-home care provider on a more regular schedule for those kind of regular breaks away from caregiving or while you're working, maybe have someone there. Or if you just kind of need it from time to time, um, you could schedule it maybe once a week or a couple times a month. So you can get away and do those things that you need to do for yourself. Um, so there's a lot of different ways you can approach getting respite or time away. You could ask family members and friends. That's how kind of often it starts out. You know, hey, could you check in on mom while I'm away, or could you take um, him or her to, to lunch so then I can have time to get some things done for myself. So you could, you could go about it that way. Um, you could uh, call home instead or find another in-home care provider. And we can drop some, some links in the chat. We have a great home care guide that helps you think about, you know, um, what is home care? What are some questions I should ask when I interview various rest providers home care providers. Uh, so we can share the link to that. Um, and then also you can look into your local respite program. So a lot of area agencies on aging have respite programs. Uh, respite resource centers is usually what they're called. So, um, you know, and in those centers, they might be able to connect you with short, even short-term stays of, for um, 
long-term care facilities. So if you maybe wanted to take a weekend away on vacation, or if you had a business trip and you needed to temporarily have your loved one move to a facility for a short period of time, uh, sometimes um, those respite centers can help coordinate that, or you could reach out to a local care community to see if they offer kind of a short-term stay. So uh, those are just a few um, insights on respite, but that time away from caregiving helps you um, to kind of maintain that balance and helps you kind of recharge your own batteries, uh, kind of helps you work towards that um, probably post caregiving life so you can continue to take good care of yourself. So thanks for letting me kind of steal the mic there for a second, Liz, and <laughs> talk about respite. Um, and then we have another question from Lisa. She's saying, any advice for caregiving daughters who are trying to handle this from hundreds of miles away from my parents? So that long distance caregiver, we haven't even touched on that yet, mm -hmm. Liz. Any tips yeah. for, for Lisa and other long distance caregivers? Yeah, I, I mean, you, you've got to have some sort of boots on the ground, you know, somebody um, who can provide, you know, the localized care that you need, um, whether it's a neighbor and, you know, and again, when I mention these things, I mentioned them with what, that concept we just talked about at some point as, you know, as care advance, as people age, as, you know, illnesses advance, don't be afraid to renegotiate what might have started out as a solution won't always be the solution. So whether it's a neighbor who, you know, is willing to be your eyes and ears or uh, go to doctor's visits with you, you've got to have some sort of person, you know, geriatric care managers, aging managers are great um, to help coordinate care, but, the, but to have somebody there to coordinate care um, when you can't be there. Um, visits will become, you know, super important when you are there in person. There are things that you can observe, you know, is mail piling up and the bills unpaid? Um, is food, you know, fresh or going bad in the fridge? Um, Reevaluating every time you do visit the living situation or, you know, for my mom, it was, you know, she was shrinking so much from her osteoporosis that um, every, you know, year I would have to move the dishes down while we're in the cabinets because otherwise should reach up and fall or, you know, area rugs no longer appropriate. Do you have the living environment set up for, you know, grab bars in the bathroom and non-slid and, and that kind of thing. So when you do go home, you know, uh, going home with sort of a checklist of things to observe and to see, you know, how the situation is or isn't progressing. And then cautioning people when they do go home, um, you know, and the, the pressures of being a long distance caregiver can be that, um, you know, you go home and you're like, I have a weekend at home and I need to fix everything. And you kind of come in like a bull at a china shop and try to like have these conversations with your parent and tell them it's time to move and, um, you know, know that it just doesn't work that way, that these conversations we have with parents is parents are a process. They're never a one and done conversation. So setting your expectations about how much you can do when you do come to visit um, or that you can do from a long distance. I mean, hopefully more and more doctors will keep virtual calls something um, so that you can participate in important doctor's appointments. I always found too that, you know, even pre-COVID, um, just because I couldn't always be at a doctor's appointment didn't mean I couldn't communicate with a doctor. I could still always email them. Um, even there were some doctors who I didn't have a relationship with, so they didn't know that, you know, they were allowed to talk to me due to HIPAA rules or that sort of thing. I would say, okay, well, you can't talk to me, but I can talk to you. And here's what I'm observing. And here are the list of things I need you to, you know, um, inquire about at this appointment. So, so communication with a doctor can still be one way, and that can be effective, even if it can't be two ways. Um, but figuring out who that person is, whether it's a paid care manager or um, a family member, is, you, you, you need a partner. Mm. Such great tips. Uh, and long distance can be, can be really hard. So Lisa, know that you are, are doing a great job and hopefully those tips can be helpful um, to you and to the others that are listening. Um, we have a great question from Demetra. She's saying, um, what do you do when you have a 38 year old boss that's just starting out in life with the young family and doesn't understand? Gosh, I'm sure that there's others probably nodding their heads like, yes, this is similar to my situation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I would say approach that person um, with data, if you can, as opposed to, um, you know, like personal anecdotes, because, um, you know, 
care, elder care, like parenting, unfortunately, like we haven't found the magic formula to get people to understand and care about these things until it happens to them. It just, we just haven't figured that out across so many issues in life. Um, and, you know, it's unfortunate because like, when we started this conversation, you wish everyone didn't have to reinvent the wheel, but you know, I, I do some consulting with um, a company and there's a group of young mothers and I joke that they have just discovered motherhood. I'm like, you know, they're like, this is really hard. And I'm like, really? People haven't been talking about that for centuries, right? You know, and it's the same thing. This 38 year old at some point will be like, oh, I should have been a more compassionate boss, but right now maybe they're not. So um, I wouldn't try to appeal to that boss with, you know, emotion and personal um, situations. I would try to appeal to that boss with data. You know, this is the work set, you know, X number of people are caring. We really should be considering how that, you know, we set policies for that. Um, maybe you approach it from a pure, you know, a quality standpoint. Like if we have these policies for parents, then we must have these policies for workers with parents um, to talk to that person from the perspective of, can we create a workplace environment that allows people to have flexibility for their personal lives as opposed to, um, you know, for parenting or for coaching Little League or for, you know, meeting the bus. Um, I always tell managers and employees alike to try to uh, adapt the, what I call a don't ask, don't tell policy. So trying to create a corporate culture where instead of me saying, Lakeland, can I leave uh, Wednesday at three to take my mother to the podiatrist? Um, I say, Lakeland, can I leave, uh, you know, Wednesday at three because I have a personal appointment and here's where the work stands and here's who's going to cover for me where I'm gone and here's when I'll be back online and here's what you should do if, you know, any questions arise. And same thing, if you come to me, I don't say, well, why do you need that time off? I say, okay, well, where do things stand? How will they be covered? Great. Awesome. Go, you know, go do what you need to do in your life. So trying to get the workplace and this supervisor to understand that, we all live complicated lives. So how do we set up a workplace culture where you can go coach Little League, I can go to the podiatrist, somebody else can go to the vet, and somebody else can go volunteer, you know, if, if that's something that they're trying to fit in. We all have work life. So try to make it more universal and less specific to a, te to a scenario they're just not going to get yet. <laughs> yeah, I like how you, you talked about that. I even look at my own team, um, you know, and at various points we have um, females of, of all ages. So we have had, you know, those that are caring for aging parents, those with younger uh, kiddos at home. And, and the leader of our team has always said, you guys, it's okay. There'll be times where you'll need us to pick up your kind of um, tasks. And then we're going to reciprocate that at some point, because you're right. Everyone kind of goes through these phases. Caregiving happens to everyone. I love that Rosalind Carter quote about it. If you're not a caregiver, you will be one or you'll need one. Um, or you've been one. Yeah. Or you've been one, yes. Yeah. So um, really it, it touches all of us. And, and while we might not call it caregiving specifically, uh, we are all caring usually for someone in our life or, or care about something that's important to us. And if we can balance that with our work and our personal obligations, um, then we'll all kind of live a more fulfilled life. So I love how you talk about creating approaching it from that place of, of equality and, and with data, uh, and especially, um, you know, in, in organizations, you know, for-profit organizations, they're very data-driven. So sometimes if you talk their language, right. they're going to be more likely to understand. So thanks mm -hmm. for those tips. Um, a, a great question from Brenda. She's asking, you know, are, care, are caregiving children also helping to organize their parents' end-of-life plans, wills, trusts, getting lists of bank accounts. She's wondering when's the right time to have these types of discussions with them? Right now. <laughs> um, yes, um, hopefully they are because it, it is makes things so much easier when end of life comes. Um, if you've had those conversations and if you've set things up in advance. It is a very difficult conversation for so many people to have because, you know, as a society, um, as a country, we are really uncomfortable talking about death. It is, we are just not there as a nation um, in talking about death. Um, so I say, you know, um, if we can frame these conversations with as much, you know, couching and, 
um, you know, fluff as we need to, to, you know, we all know our own families, family norms, right? You know, I, I grew up Irish, Boston, you know, it's all sarcasm, right? So if I walked in and try, you know, it was dripping with sweetness and compassion, it wouldn't fly, right? But if I come in and I cut some sarcastic joke, then, you know, people in my family are more likely to listen to me. So we, we all have our styles. So figure out what, you know, you sort of need to layer into that conversation to get the conversation started. But, um, if you can start that conversation, it is about, you know, help me help you or help, can you help me? I want to make sure that, you know, whatever you want, I can do my best to support you and, and help out with when the time comes. Um, I often say that the conversation that can be easier with a parent, instead of talking about like your life is going to end and your world is going to get smaller and what you're able to do is, you know, going to be limited. Um, to talk about like, what are your goals for the next phase of your life? And what, if any, do you have a vision for, you know, end of life? And how can I help with that? And then, you know, um, like I said, all of these things are conversations, not one and done. So say, you know, push to the brink of discomfort and then pull back for a while if you need to, you know, if, you, if your parent isn't willing to have these conversations. But when you do have these conversations, when you're clear about, um, you know, what your parents have in place, what their financial situation is, what their um, end of life care wishes are. It is such a gift. And it goes back to uh, what I was talking about with the value system and having a uh, framework or a, a foundation, I should say, for making decisions. Um, when you have these conversations ahead of time, then when you're grieving or you're in the ER and you're stressed out, it's going to be less challenging to, you know, under that great stress to figure out what to do. Um, and if you haven't had the conversation, then trust that you've known your parent your whole life and you're going to do your best um, based on what you know about your parent. So, you know, for those who maybe have missed the moment and can't have the conversation, you will figure it out. You will do your best and it will be good enough. And um, if you haven't had it with your partner or spouse or your children, now is a perfectly good time. <laughs> It's an excellent time to get that in place for yourself as well. Yeah. And, and sometimes uh, I've found success, you know, sharing my wishes and using my wishes or my thoughts as a door to open conversation. You know, mm -hmm. for example, like I've been thinking a lot, a lot lately about whether I want cremation or um, a traditional, you know, burial. Mom, mm -hmm. have you thought about that? Have you and dad talked about that? What would you want? I'm curious to know. So sometimes also approaching it from that place of, you know, sharing your own personal um, thoughts um, mm -hmm. can also help. And then also it helps you and your family uh, plan. So, um, so often we, we see families in crisis mode. I'm, I know Liz, you probably see this as well. And, and those that have planned, um, you know, the stress and the strain and the guilt afterwards is, is reduced because yeah. you had those conversations, you know, what they wanted, or um, you've, you've at least talked about it. And so it makes those kind of decisions a little easier. They're never going to be completely never gonna be easy, easy. Yeah. Oh, I've just loved this conversation. We have so many more questions coming in. I really wish we had time to tackle all of them. So if we didn't get to your question, we'll hopefully at least get you some resources um, on, on Facebook or in the chat. Um, and thank you all so much for tuning in. Liz, thank you so much for sharing your, your wisdom and your experience and for creating that Working Daughters community. And again, we put her website in the chat. Please follow Liz and the work she does because it is so important and meaningful. Thanks, Liz, for joining us. Thank you. Such an important conversation. I'm appreciative to anyone who addresses it. Thank you. Yes. Well, the pleasure was all ours. And this is part of a series called Caregiver Chats. Our next chat in the series will be June 21st. And we're talking about why get a dementia diagnosis. June is uh, a national like brain health and Alzheimer's awareness month. And so we are going to be tackling that topic specifically. So we invite you to join us back on June 21st. You can visit our website, helpforalzheimersfamilies.com or follow us on Facebook to get all the latest information on upcoming chats. Um, and we hope to see you back next time. Until then, remember to take good care of yourself while you're caring for others. We'll see you next time. Bye.